the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Justin. Hey, Lindsay. I'm so happy to be back in the studio right now. This is very strange. This is uh, 17 months we've uh, spent not being able to record in person. A lot of that was due to, you know... The pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. But (laughs) the last three months we've been... I was uh, redoing the studio and trying to get it reset up and and uh, updated and now we're back in person so you might notice that our sound sounds a little more powerful uh it's it's fun to be able to actually look you in the eye in person and we've got all the dogs here with us which has been uh probably this is this whole thing has been the worst on them us recording remotely it has been the hardest i mean i have to turn well we both have to turn off our air you know and i mean not that we don't have to do that here when we're all together but it's it's a struggle it can be and it seems to go on much longer too when we record remotely and it's the hardest on my cats though right now they're not knocking over bowls of food and having to make us stop recording to so they can eat well not only am i excited that we're recording in person again this is our fourth year where we're doing our favorite season It's Halloween-themed movie season, and uh, our fourth year of doing all horror movies for the month of October, we usually also do a, we throw in an extra episode, so you'll be getting an extra episode for October. We always try to do somewhat of a series, you know, something, a a theme that ties all three of these movies together, and this year we went with uh, 40th anniversaries. Wild that there were three movies in 1981 that came out that uh, all three are pretty uh, effective um, and great horror movies that still hold up today. And so our first one being American Werewolf in London. Next up, we'll have My Bloody Valentine and we'll close things out with The Great Evil Dead. We wanted to kick things off strongly. And man, speaking of a movie that really holds up 40 years later, watching this movie over the last few weeks, I think I almost like it more now than I did back in the day because it's a fun movie, but you know, it's got some great characters, amazing special effects by Rick Baker. A lot of things to talk about with this movie. I was familiar with this film all throughout my childhood, but it hits differently as an adult. Man, I have not gotten tired of watching it. There's some movies you watch them over and over again. You're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. And today on my last rewatch of this one, I felt like kind of sad leaving it. I don't know. I love this movie. Yeah, this is one that uh, really has a great mix of humor and scares and uh, also one that, uh, you know, you, you start to care for the characters. And I know that... Uh, That's something that, you know, in most movies, you you should kind of care for the characters, but it can always be hard in horror movies because generally someone's going to end up getting killed pretty, (laughs) pretty quickly. And I think this movie does a great way of uh, killing off a character that, um, you know, is is a good character. But then we 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 still get to visit with that character throughout the movie and in a very odd way of that character being undead, but still communicating with (laughs) the other his living friend. We'll talk about uh, several things uh, with this movie, how the movie got going, the script, the tone of the film, how this movie holds up amongst other horror films of the time. And even now, the history of how this movie got going the shooting of it. We'll certainly talk about director John Landis, who uh, was really on fire this time in the you know early 80s, just one hit after another. And of course, we always love talking about the cast. And there are a few fun stories there. The reception, release of the film, the music of the film, it certainly stands out. And why this movie was important when it came out in 1981. I also hope we talk about some of our favorite moments from the movie too. I didn't really think about that when I went to revisit this film that there are just countless moments that are stuck in my head like either terrifying or funny or just moments that you're like oh yeah that totally happens I love that part many memorable scenes 
Well, after our talk on American Werewolf, we'll get into our picks of the week. Like we do every October, we keep our picks of the week in the horror genre as well, but always trying to connect them to our future film and discussion. Lindsay, what was your pick this week? I went with another John Landis film from 1992 called Innocent Blood. This was a first watch for me, and you tried your best to not spoil anything for me or give me any of your opinion. Certainly, I'm really happy. I mean, obviously, I did this as a pick. I'm, I'm happy I chose this one, but it's, uh, it's different. <laughs> Yeah, it's another one of those movies that's sort of blending humor and horror together. Not quite as well as American Werewolf, but admirable. And Justin, what about you? What was your pick this time? Uh, As always, I had a hard time coming up with my pick of the week. (laughs) I start out with like 10 that I want to do, and then I narrow it down, and then I usually watch one and then change my mind. And uh, it was the same with this, but I eventually landed on Michael Jackson's Thriller. I know it's not a feature film, but I think it... It's just fits so well because it is, uh, you know, has a Halloween vibe to it. And, uh, you know, we've got the reteaming of John Landis and Rick Baker again, so I couldn't resist. Maybe the biggest Halloween movie ever made, I think, is Thriller. I also went back and forth on my picks of the week. There were two David Naughton movies. I could definitely talk to someone about them, but I don't know if I would do, do them as a pick of the week. Not because of David Naughton. Totally great actor. Great guy. We'll round things out with our Murray moment, but before we get into our first clip from American Werewolf Lindsay, can you give me your interpretation of what this movie's about? Well, two American friends, David and Jack, are backpacking across Europe. On one particular night, they're haplessly wandering the moors of northern England and are attacked by some sort of beast. Jack's killed, and David is left hospitalized, only remembering bits of what happened, but knowing for sure it was not a human which caused this mayhem. While being haunted by nightmares and visits from the very corporeal ghost of his dead friend Jack, David's nurse, Alex, takes a shine to him and takes him into her home once he's discharged. Love might be blooming here between the two, but with sporadic murderous rampages popping up all over England, David is faced with the awful truth the ghostly Jack has been telling him. He's going to fully transform into a werewolf unless he puts a stop to this supernatural phenomenon and takes his own life. You know, on paper, it's real hard to see how this movie has any comedy woven into it, but it's there. We'll tell you about everything. The title says it all in a way, but there's so much (laughs) more going on, and we'll get into all that. But for now, let's go into uh, our first clip from the movie, and then we'll be back. David! What? Now, I'm really sorry to be upsetting you, but I have to warn you. Warn me? We were attacked by a werewolf. I'm not listening to this. On the moors, we were attacked by a lycanthrope, a werewolf. I was murdered, an unnatural death. And now I walk the earth in limbo until the werewolf's curse is lifted. Shut up. The wolf's bloodline must be severed. The last remaining werewolf must be destroyed. It's you, David. What? Please believe me. You'll kill people. Nurse! Listen to me! Nurse! The supernatural. (laughs) The power of darkness, it's all true. The undead surround me. Have you ever talked to a corpse? It's boring. I'm lonely. Take your life, David. Kill yourself before you kill others. Please don't cry. We'll talk more about Landis a little bit later on in our discussions, but I want to say right off the top here that to me, this seems like the most Landis movie. You know, it's one of the handful of movies that he wrote himself. Uh, It was clearly an idea that he had brewing for such a long time before the movie went into production. And he's just a director who you can tell is is a guy who loves movies. You know, he was a movie buff, grew up on movies and got started at an extremely young age in the entertainment industry, fresh out of high school, kind of like launched himself into the world of movie making. It's interesting how this movie came from such a young mind, sort of fermented for like, you know, almost a decade before uh, coming to light. 
Yeah, it was totally a decade. It's insane to me that 18-year-old John Landis could come up with this story and write a script, and he certainly did. But the origin of that is pretty unique. So in 1969, Landis was a grip working on the 1970 movie Kelly's Heroes with uh, Donald Sutherland, Clint Eastwood, Telly Savalas. It's a war movie. I, I think I saw it when I was a kid, but I don't remember it very well at all. But um, Landis tells this story about how he was out with one of the assistant directors and he was just driving him all over Yugoslavia. They were just kind of out seeing the countryside. And they came upon this funeral and what Landis describes as the gypsy funeral. And he noticed immediately that the body that was being buried, there were some strange things that he hadn't seen before. One, that the body was wrapped in garlic and rosaries in this canvas. But two that it was being buried feet first. And so this is just like blown him out of the water. And Landis is today the guy he was when he was 18 and needed to know everything. He was asking questions and asked the guy he was with, Sasha, can you find out the story? And as it goes, the person that was being buried had committed these horrible crimes. And the reason that they were burying him feet first, and this was out of superstition, was that his body wouldn't be able to rise up and come back and create mischief. And Sasha, the guy that's with John Landis, is, you know, laughing this off and it's just like, oh, it's ridiculous, you know, these these old legends. And Landis doesn't, you know, buy into it either, but he starts thinking about this idea. You know, what if you do come upon something, this improbable situation that shouldn't exist in reality, but you're confronted with it in front of your very eyes? How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it when the improbable is right before you? So this is where the idea for American Werewolf in London comes from. And it is still really crazy to me that Landis starts writing the script to this when he's 18. Yeah. Generally, when people write movies when they're really, really young, it's like, write what you know, some sort of personal story. But he goes for <laughs> the sort of like pretty wildly original werewolf movie. Just a very impressive thing to do at such a young age. Yeah, it totally is. And it might sound like this would be headed towards the zombie realm, right? Well, what Landis was thinking, as someone who grew up watching the Universal Monster movies, that's immediately where his mind went. And as he started doing research into those types of characters, he became kind of fascinated with the idea of the werewolf. And that being the werewolf is one of the only monsters that when they come back or when they have this rebirth, it's not about resurrection. They don't have to die first. And from that moment, from when they are bitten by a werewolf, they're doomed to die. There's no other outcome. It's a sad story. And he was taken with that. So he started doing research into this and there's plenty of different types of mythologies out there. And he found that like the most amount of people uh, being killed for being a werewolf were from Wales and France. And he didn't know French. So he thought, OK, let's go to England. So that's where the idea of setting this movie in England came from. Yeah, I wonder if working on the first movie when he worked as a grip on Kelly's Heroes gave him the idea of like, yeah, I don't have to shoot the my movie in Hollywood, maybe shooting a, a movie somewhere outside of L.A. Uh, might make things interesting. And I do think that the fact that this movie doesn't take place in America, it makes it different from other movies of that time period. Yeah, I think him working on Kelly's Heroes certainly played into why he was excited about setting this in Europe. So fast forward to 1971. He's working on his first feature length film, Schlock, which if you know the Joan Crawford legendary movie Trog. Um, it is kind of a comedic play on Trog. You might think that Trog is a comedic play on itself. Anyway, that aside, he's working on Schlock, and this is where he meets Rick Baker for the first time and really recognizes Rick Baker's talent in special effects and makeup and starts talking to him about American Werewolf, lets him read the script, and Rick Baker is kind of excited about this, and they start talking about it a little bit, and, I mean, keep in mind, this is far away from when this movie came out in 81. We're talking 10 years prior. So they're talking about how to make things work in this film. And the biggest thing that John wants to happen is that the transformation scene has to be real. He doesn't want something that's just the lap dissolves of overlapping scenes together to where one dissolves into another, like the 1941 Wolfman. And like they, I mean, that was brilliant then, but he wanted real hard special effects and it to be not an easy experience. So he plants the seed with Rick Baker and says, 
would you be interested in doing this once I'm able to make it happen? And it really seems like Rick Baker was completely on board. So with script in hand, Rick Baker semi on board with the promise that this movie is going to happen. John Landis sets out to try to sell this movie. And it's not getting like the most amount of like posit- overwhelming positive reception. A lot of people just don't get it. They either think it's too funny to be scary or too scary to be funny. And a lot of people saw this script, I guess. And it wasn't that anyone like really vehemently like hated it. It was just confusing a lot of people. They just didn't know where to go with it, even though this was a completely traditional story. But despite people not getting it, Landis still knew that he had a great script, a really good story. He knew that somehow he could make this work. And he also knew about this thing called the British Quota System, which was a tax incentive plan that encouraged people to make movies in Britain as long as they had British content. And there would also be some type of kickback for anyone who helped put out the movie, like producer, distributor, that sort of thing. So he thinks, great, I want to set this movie in London. I want to make it unmistakably London. This is, you know, the land of gothic horror. This is perfect. So he sets out with the idea of, okay, this movie is going to have a $10 million negative pickup, meaning that the financer is going to give you a contract guaranteeing money for the movie once it's delivered with specific requirements. And the only one that I heard about was that this movie had to be R-rated. I don't know what exactly like why that was an issue other than in 1981 having an R rating is going to matter a little bit more than it does nowadays. I mean, a a lot of movies were still getting a pass for like PG, like Raiders of the Lost Ark was still was PG. So maybe R was just a lot harder than that's kind of what I'm guessing. Anyway, Landis didn't care. Perfect. Great. You're going to give me money and that's all I have to do. Perfect. So he approaches Polygram. They liked it, totally believed in Landis. And I mean, he's coming off of mega hits like Animal House and Blues Brothers. Like we said, we'll talk about him later, but they believed in him. So they gave him a contract. And once the movie's delivered, Polygram is going to pay back the bank. And this leaves Landis completely responsible for making and delivering the movie. He felt confident he was ready to do it. So he had the money. It's it's kind of awesome. I mean, it took him 10 years, but he did it. So I guess it's here where he calls up Rick Baker and he says, hey, remember that idea, Werewolf movie idea I had like (laughs) 10 years ago? Anyway, I finally got the money for it. Yeah, and theoretically, Rick Baker's had a lot of time to conceptualize this whole transformation thing that was going to be groundbreaking, right? He's got got nothing else going on, right? Rick Baker, he's done nothing else in that 10 years, being very facetious, of course. But... John Landis does call him up and he says, hey, old buddy, remember the werewolf movie? You want to get started on that? I've got the money. And Rick Baker says, that's funny. I'm working on a werewolf movie. And that werewolf movie was Joe Dante's The Howling. You can imagine, even though it's not like he had him on some type of retainer, you know, like Rick Baker is still working. He's going to keep doing the do. And he was a little afraid to tell John Landis that, but he had to. And John Landis was pissed. I guess if I were Landis, I would be. But I could also be like, you know, you got to live your life and make money, too. So there's that. Like, what are the odds that (laughs) you would be doing a werewolf movie at the same time? Yeah. So it is kind of nutty that that happened at the same time. And I guess it's a little bit of a testament. I mean, I don't think John Landis threatened him by any means, but he was mad. And Rick Baker knew that and probably had something within him, some type of allegiance to a promise that he talked about 10 years prior. So he didn't exactly give up the howling, but he passed it over to his protege at the time, which was the very young Rob Bottin before he did the thing. I mean, before he blew up, but Rob Bottin is handed this entire movie, and he's a youngin and expected to take it over. Rick Baker stayed on as consultant, but he basically moved on over to American Werewolf. But he did say to John Landis, yo, I need six months at least to get prepped, and your two leads, I need to make full molds of them, so I need a lot of time before we even get there. So once Landis has Rick Baker on board, the movie's in full swing. We'll get into the cast in our next discussion, but one of the things that I think makes this movie unique to the werewolf genre is that Landis borrowed from werewolf movies that he grew up, that he loved, but it was a genre that didn't really have legs, so to speak. Um, there were uh, several European werewolf subgenre type movies, but 
um, in America, the horror genre had shifted. You know, we were starting to get into slasher films. The Exorcist had been a huge hit six or seven years prior. And Landis wanted to do something a little bit different. And he was a comedy director. That was his thing. He had two or three comedy hits under his belt already. And he was blending horror and comedy together. Now, this was something that had been done many times before in the genre, but not so much to this extent to where it was a very, very thin line between horror and comedy. Now, when this movie hit, a lot there was a lot of criticism about the movie of it being too funny to be scary and too scary to be funny. I have to admit, after reading those criticisms and watching this movie uh, multiple times over the last several weeks, I, I really do agree with that assessment. I do find many, many moments of this movie quite terrifying. But overall, um, I think that a lot of the humor in it to me sometimes it overrides the the horror elements but don't get me wrong i think landis does an incredible job of of mixing the two genres together and i think that's what makes this movie so fun and i also think that's what makes this movie so different for horror movies of the early 80s we were really like knee deep into the start of the slasher genre and when you look at movies that came out horror movies around this time it really is a an incredible shift. And it also, I think by Landis not making this a full on horror movie, it allowed him to get probably a bigger budget than other horror movies would be allowed if it was just a straight werewolf movie, if there wasn't a more human element to the film and even dramatic shifts in tone. And that's something that uh, we both were talking off the mic, Lindsay, that we had uh, somewhat different feelings about how this movie opened. I find really the opening of this movie pretty hilarious and the humor to be over the top when they go into the slaughtered lamb. We almost have that traditional record scratch of like they walk in. Clearly, these guys aren't from around here and everybody turns around, stops what they're doing, stops their conversation. And there's this awkward moment where David and Jack are standing there and they just look so opposite of everybody. To me, the, the what follows is a, a humorous scene of them trying to mingle with with the, the, the folks people and then realizing there's something strange going on with the pentagram on the wall, um, how serious people are talking about, uh, you know, stay off the moors, like beware of the moon. And while I'm having so much fun in the opening of this is by the time Jack is attacked by the wolf, it's so shocking to me because up until that point, it's a pretty jovial movie. But I do think Landis does a great job of let's start this movie off and bring the viewer in, make them comfortable, let them understand the relationship that Jack and David have, what their dynamic dynamic is and then you know kind of punch you in the gut with a, a werewolf attack scene that's that's quite vicious I mean it is a very dreadful scene and it is horrible in the way of not only is it kind of scary that he's getting attacked by a werewolf but that the fact that David starts running away and he leaves Jack behind while Jack is like pleading for help and you know and then doubles back but by the time he doubles back there's not much he can do as Jack's been ripped to shreds you know I think I just realized something I think that you're David and I'm Jack I think that's the difference because David is the one that's like, all right, weirdos, you guys are being kind of silly in here. We're just going to leave on out of here. And Jack's like, what's going on with that pentagram? Because that's kind of weird. And I don't know if movies have told us anything. Pentagrams mean werewolf. The opening to this movie, to me, has such an ominous tone. And I get what you're saying as far as the humorous elements, what they're talking about. It's two guys hanging out. I, I know these guys. I've hung out with them. Yeah, it, it, it sets up something that's completely ominous. And I, I give in to the, they're walking into a bar called The Slaughtered Lamb. That's, I mean, that's red flag number one. You know, I think that's what I'm looking at when I see that. And while the comedy aspect is all over this film, this isn't a knee slapper to me. And I don't think Landis was trying to make a knee slapper like previous movies like he's done. The heavier tones, and again, I don't think you and I are saying anything that's completely opposite or, you know, contradicting each other. I think it's just a different take on the same kind of things. We're just affected by it in different ways. American Werewolf has too many serious elements for me to ever label it a comedy. In fact, I think it was on Amazon that I saw it there the other day and it was just labeled comedy. And that seems completely inappropriate. It is not a comment like just straight up comedy to me. If anything, it has comedic elements. It has way too many scary moments for me. I'm not going to joke around about suicide and there's, I mean, 
Jack's telling David to kill himself pretty much every time he he shows up on screen as a as a ghost. But I think that that's one of the greatest things about this movie and what plays into why it had such a problem when it came out was that people didn't know how to take it. But that was one of the greatest things about it now in hindsight is that this movie set in motion what so many other films thought, hey, that's not a half bad idea. And it's kind of reinventing what we can do with horror movies. You know, I agree with you. The tones of this movie are dark, and especially the latter part of the film where David is considering suicide and, you know, he's realizing that when he transforms into the werewolf, he's going out into the night, he's killing innocent people. And one of the things I love about this movie is the character of Jack talking to David from the dead. He's like slowly decaying every time we see him looking more and more like zombie-ish. The tone in the movie there is like pretty funny. I think the idea is to make it a very like black comedy and Jack is getting more and more disgusting every time he talks to David. Oh, you know, pretty frightening looking really and, and pretty gross looking because of the way that they went over the top and had him so disgusting looking. He can have the conversation of like, you know, you need to consider killing yourself. And also the scene where all the other all the other victims of of David after he'd become the werewolf for also and takes place in a movie theater of all places. And they're all saying, you know, you need to kill yourself. And they're talking about the different ways he should do it. I think that is the the best way to approach this subject matter, because if you take away the, the Jack character and you don't have him consulting David and this movie was strictly David realizing that he's been killing innocent people and the only person he can confide in is a nurse that took pity on him in the hospital and started a a fling with him the movie immediately becomes like a very depressing tale (laughs) of someone who is killing people and they're waging war against their conscience and ultimately what you get is a is a very um emotionally wrecking movie like the fly you know if you take (laughs) away the jack character (laughs) and the fly is a great movie but it's not one that i can return to time and time again because it is a very a hard-hitting emotional film that is it's a tough watch at times and american werewolf london to me remains fun through most of the movie even though there are some horrifying things and even though like we said the tone shifts from light to dark uh, time and time again throughout the movie but landis is really does a great job of towing that line and i honestly think that you know i said in the beginning of this that this to me feels like the most landis movie he writes these characters in a very relatable way and because the comedy isn't hitting you so hard you never lose sight of of liking these characters where in some of his other movies it's all about the jokes and it's all about somebody coming in with a punchline or it's all about a setup and because the jokes aren't being set up time and time again in this there's some humorous elements to it and some of the things that the characters say are funny i think that it becomes more of a realistic tale like a realistic portrayal of two characters even though they're put in this scary situations but then also the thing that landis does it's so smart that really doesn't get enough credit for this movie i'll cite scream as a movie that i truly love that came out in 1996 when scream came out it was like people's minds were blown like the only thing i ever read and criticisms of it and and people praising it was it it was the first you know horror movie that's self-referential it's talking about horror movies in a horror movie and referencing them and talking about the rules and all this stuff but Landis does that right away in the beginning of American Werewolf in London when they're at the Slaughtered Lamb. Jack brings up the pentagram and werewolves. Later on, when David's talking to his girlfriend, he says, you know, think I'm a werewolf. She brings up Lon Chaney, you know, as the werewolf. They bring up werewolf movies. That's something that, you know, we we feel comfortable in this world. Like we know that werewolves exist. But John Landis does it in the way that he references movies instead of making us go through a scene where they're laying down the law of like, here's what you have to do. Even the scene where David brings up, well, what about silver bullets? And Jack's like, come on, David, you know, this is, it's like, he almost like, it's like, don't, don't be silly. I love the way that this movie references those movies. And I think it's a great way to, again, set up this idea that this is werewolf and we were dealing with werewolves in, I don't know, pretty smart and stylish for 1981. Not too many movies, I feel like, had done that at that time. No, I think you're 100% correct there. And I think the joking helps humanize these people. And one aspect, whenever this film is referred to as a dark comedy, dark comedy, you say that, and the movie Death Becomes Her 
comes to my mind. And I have to say that if we're going to put those in the same category, it's almost like one is 95% on the joking side, even though it's completely dealing with zombies, you know, people that are like repeatedly killing each other. And if you were to take the comedy out of it, it would be like total horror movie. But the way that it's set up is a comedy. And in that vein, that's a movie that's set up like a comedy. And that's why I will always have to say like, this is set up like a horror movie, but it has these comedic elements to make us care and humanize these people and give a crap when David dies at the end. And I'm sure you don't react this way, Justin, but at the end, no matter how much I try, when Jenny is trying to talk to wolfed out David cornered in an alley we know he's gonna die and she says i love you and then he lunges after her gets shot dies she watches him transform and then you see the slow breakdown of her like dissolving that to me i can't like i can't handle it it's like totally sad that's the end of a horror movie but then what does landis do he hits you with a doo-wop song that closes out the credits and I I get why people were confused, but if anything, it's a horror movie that doesn't leave you depressed or completely scared, and it has the comedy to thank for that. And I wanted to add, too, that for 1981 horror movie, we were used to seeing teenagers on screen. We were used to seeing generally like some sort of like high school setting, young person-esque setting, and the fact that this movie opens in another country in a very like serious stodgy um part of town and that yeah. the fact that we're we're not opening with teenagers these guys are well into their 20s it just it sets a very different uh atmosphere for the beginning of a horror film but i think we can all agree that what makes this movie so unique and what makes this movie hold up is rick baker's effects the transformation scene in this movie is truly terrifying it looks painful it gives you a sense that this really is a curse that being a werewolf is there's nothing cool about it it's not like there are these pros about it like being a vampire like i'm gonna get to live forever it looks terrible you're riddled with guilt for people that you've killed when you've turned and then this idea that you're going to go through this brutal painful experience of the transformation into a werewolf is what really drives the scene. And the Rick Baker transformation scene still, I think, is one of the most great special effects scenes of all time. Yeah, it sure does stick with you, doesn't it? I mean, that's one scene that has never left me. I think with anybody thinking back on this film, if they've seen it, you think of that scene immediately. And originally, Rick Baker didn't want any cutaways. He just wanted this entire transformation scene to unfold as it was in John Landis, didn't think that that was going to be the most dramatically effective way to communicate the scene. And in the end, it looked better and it was just more functional as a way to complete all of the effects that Rick Baker had planned for this. You were just going to need to have multiple cutaways. I think Rick Baker said that he thought, man, I was crazy thinking that because he said <laughs> that it would have been impossible to do it yeah. all in one shot. <laughs> yeah. One being that it was shot all in reverse sequence. <laughs> that would have been difficult. But that was a decision that they chose to do was to start at full transformation of David and work backwards because it's easier to trim the fur off of him than it is to keep adding prosthetics on. It's easier to just take it all off. And even after watching some of the behind the scenes on how they made this, it still was mind boggling to me. I was like, yeah. wait, what happened? Still a he mystery. Had some sort of like thing that pushed air and made his arm stretch out. But then you cut to the real human hand. The The way that they sequenced the transformation is really great. And again, the hair that's slowly growing is very, very uh, okay. real looking. Landis, not only did he say, you know, I don't want to... I want to do this in sequence. I want to do different shots that are cut together to make the transformation um, more interesting and more cinematic. He also didn't want to show the werewolf too much. He told Rick Baker, you know, I only want to see this thing a couple seconds at a time on screen. Now, if you're the guy who's 
working on special effects on this thing, like dedicating like hours and hours and hours of your time, like making little hairs and, <laughs> and creating the effects to know that your work is only going to be shown for a few seconds on screen. is probably pretty disheartening. And Rick Baker did say that when he found out how little time the werewolf was on screen, he was kind of bummed out. But then he said that, you know, when he went to a screening with all of the uh, students and people that worked on the special effects with him, when the transformation scene ended like people in the crowd were like cheering and he said oh no I get, I get it now I understand why John didn't want to show too much and I think it works really well I think there's other werewolf movies that I've seen since American Werewolf in London and one of the issues that they do is they do hold on the werewolf too long and the longer you see a special effect the less special it looks you can see you know what doesn't look real and I think it was a great choice of just like prime moments to show the werewolf when it's attacking or cut cutting away without uh, showing the entire body of the werewolf. When they do show the entire body during that transformation scene is with David on his back. I mean, I know that David Naughton, the upper half of him is in the floor and like the whole body that's changing is a creation of Rick Baker. It doesn't look like that to me. Like it's it's an odd looking body, but I mean, he's changing into a giant wolf. So Anything that does look off, it's not like I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's obvious that he's, you know, half in the floor. It doesn't even look like that. It's like totally crazy. And because the transformation scene is so memorable, it's easy to forget that Rick Baker did a whole lot more on the movie than just that. You know, we have Jack's decaying body um, that we see time and time again, which is very reminiscent to the work that he did in Thriller, which I'll talk about soon in my pick of the week. But also the fantasy sequence where the Nazi type werewolves attack David and his family. They kept calling them uh, pullover masks. Those are the most terrifying pullover masks. Like They just made it seem like it was super simple. They were the first pieces that they made for the production because I guess that they were just, you know, the easiest. Those things are terrifying. And sure, we only see them for a few seconds and they have a fixed expression on their face. But what's happening is complete chaos. They're just blowing up and killing everything in David's family home. And the maniacal, crazy faces that they have on match what I would imagine a, you know, hound from hell, a Nazi hound from hell would look like in that scene. And as terrifying as those creatures were, the scariest thing in this movie to me is the weird blue demon face that pops up for maybe two seconds, but it's absolutely terrifying. And David Naughton said that out of everything that he went through for this film, that that was the worst. And Rick Baker just couldn't really wrap his head around like, really, that was the worst? I like turned you into a werewolf and that face was was the worst. But it was because of the gnarly dentures that he had in his mouth and the I just have to say it's abusive <laughs> the um glass contacts that were used all the time at that point in special effects but extremely effective completely terrifying that's next to the vampire face in the end of fright night one of the most terrifying faces i've ever seen in a movie Given the fact that all these special makeup effects were so incredible, for the longest time, they had kind of been looked over when it came time for the Academy Awards. And the Academy finally had to step up and recognize, like, this is a big part of these movies. This is what makes a lot of the uh, unbelievable, believable is all the hard work that these makeup special effects artists are doing. And it was after American Wolf in London that special effects makeup and hair started getting recognized at the Academy Awards. And in 1982, American Werewolf in London was the first film. Rick Baker, being the recipient of that, was the first person to win the Academy Award for special effects makeup and hair. He went on to win that award six more times. The guy's got seven Oscars, <laughs> which is pretty incredible. Yeah, He didn't stop working. <laughs> he went on <laughs> to do a, a, a lot bigger and, and more amazing effects. But, you know, this is considered like a landmark special effects film where people really started to appreciate the creative and imaginative side of special effects artists and how important they were to the industry and how important they were to um, making movies magic. All of the different wolf heads alone that are used in this film are works of art by themselves. What takes it down a peg on the on the scary meter is knowing that Rick Baker modeled the werewolf after his dog Bosco. I think I needed to know that, that it didn't just come from somewhere in his imagination, that he actually had a muse. It was his dog. I like that. Well, let's stop there. We'll go to another clip. When we get back, we'll talk about the cast, Landis, 
the music and the release and reception of American Werewolf in London. All right. David, don't! I'm going to the police. Jack was right. Jack is dead! Yeah, Jack is dead and six people are dead. There's going to be a full moon tonight. I'm going to the cops. David, please be rational. Let's go to Dr. Hirsch. Yeah, be rational, sure. I'm a fucking werewolf, for Christ's sake. David! Officer! Officer, I killed those people last night. You did, did you? He's playing with silly Joe. You be quiet. We had an argument with things silly. I don't know this girl. All right, you two, move along, right? Come on, David. Look, come on, I want you to arrest me, you asshole. There's no call for that kind of language. Queen Elizabeth is a man! Prince Charles is a faggot! Winston Churchill is bullshit! That's enough! No! Let David, go of me. please! Shakespeare's French! Fuck! Shit! Cut! Shit! Come on, that's enough. David, enough. please! Who is this person? If you don't stop this disturbance, I shall arrest you. That's what I want you to do, you moron! He's very upset. His friend was killed. Will you shut up? All right, it's quite enough. Come on, about your business. Fuck you. Come on. You're not going to arrest me? Don't you think he should arrest me? I don't know. Perhaps he thinks it's a prank. Prank? David! Look, I've had enough of this foolishness. All right, come on, there's nothing to see. Come on, move along. It's hopeless. Come on. Let's go. Leave me alone. You people are crazy. I gotta do so. I gotta get out of here. David, don't lose control. Your control? What control? Jack was real. He tried to warn me, and I thought I was crazy. David. I love you. Again, looking back on 40 years of American Werewolf in London, one of the things that makes this movie still feel fresh to me is the fact that when the movie opens, we see two characters, two actors that I'm familiar with, but aren't these household names. And I, and I don't say that in any sort of disparaging way. A lot of times with horror movies, it's generally a lot of actors in the beginning of their career, and some of them go on to become like international superstars. You know, so when you're watching one of their old movies, one of their old horror movies, and you're like, oh my God, it's the guy who is in like eight Mission Impossible sequels or something like that. But with David Naughton and Griffin Dunn, though they had very long and still going careers, they're not faces that became like these household names, like we're in television. But my point being is when I'm watching this movie, I feel like I'm seeing two unfamiliar faces and so I get more into the movie I get more into the characters and you know I kind of like that actually about these these characters specifically and horror movies in general John Landis in in a lot of ways it seems like he slapped a lot of the casting together even though they saw over 300 actors but when you hear the stories from some of these folks it's kind of funny like David Naughton and Griffin Dunn they didn't audition for Landis at all. They just met with him. Landis saw David Naughton in a Dr. Pepper commercial. He was known as the Pepper Guy and saw his face and thought that, man, that guy would be perfect. He's so kind looking and it just seems like this would work and met with him, let him see the script. He read it, called him the next day and said, you know, wouldn't you like to be a werewolf too? Like totally cute. And that's his story. And the same thing goes for Griffin Dunn. He got a script from him and the next day called him and said, are you interested? That seems like a dream situation for both actors. And though I feel like David Naughton is very much the star of this film, it's the moments when he's on screen with Griffin Dunn that I'm the most interested. I love the continued friendship that they have even after Griffin's Dunn character has been killed. And I love the sort of smart uh disposition that Griffin Dunn is in and how he's sort of angry at David, yet yeah. you can still tell that they're very much like the friends that they were before this horrible thing happened to them. They do play off of each other well and didn't know each other before being on this film. And to be able to simulate that type of friendship, especially when you only have, what, 15 minutes to establish that and then continue to have this weird friendship throughout the rest of the movie and believe it. Yeah, their their partnership in this film and friendship certainly shines through. Yeah, I would have loved to seen just one last final farewell of the Jack character. Like, I, I know that we have this, like, hard smash cut of the final song coming on at the end of the movie, but it would have been cool to see, like, maybe his character fading away or something, or a tip of the hat or something. Like, you did it, you know, you, you got yourself <laughs> killed. You're really wanting that comedy angle, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Anything to take the piss out of a situation. <laughs> yeah. You know, these guys didn't have it easy. And Griffin Dunn, speaking of his little 
what skeleton would be tipping his hat in the, that final scene, Justin. <laughs> his makeup was not easy for him in this film. He went through three different stages of decay and just looking worse and worse. And the third stage is not even him. It's a puppet. But Griffin is controlling actually that puppet's mouth and how it speaks. So that's pretty cool. He's still acting with it. But he did feel pretty removed from that scene. But I think being able to control the mouth helped that. As far as when he was wearing his decaying makeup, and I can totally see how this would happen. The man like went into a depression over it and really started like, you know, thinking about his own death. This is what I would look like if I'm dying and just kind of wasn't prepared for how ghoulish he was going to look. And maybe that was hard to deal with for Griffin, but for David Naughton, Rick Baker straight up said, I feel sorry for you. Yeah, with David Naughton, I I think uh, he does a really great job of playing David as this very sympathetic character. I think his greatest performance in the movie is working with Rick Baker in this transformation scene. And though the special effects in that scene are really, really great, his energy, like anticipation of changing, you know, he's like waiting around and we see the sort of montage of like him waiting, waiting in his apartment. But that first burst of pain that he gets, you know, and he tears his shirt off, like you really, I mean, he really gives off the impression that he's in serious physical anguish. And uh, I think that... His acting, like kicking off the beginning of the transformation scene is what, again, makes that scene so powerful. I'm not trying to say I'm a crybaby or anything, but it is so powerful that watching him in pain makes me hurt and like kind of tear up. Like if I'm really if I'm really sitting down to watch this movie, it's happened a couple times. It's believable, man. And with Jenny Gutter, who plays Alex, the nurse who falls for David, she had been a friend of John Landis and his wife, who was the costume designer for this movie, Deborah Ndulman. And that's how she got this role. I mean, obviously, this was a British film. She is English, but she had been friends with him since 76. And though not a horror fan, she chose to do this movie because she believed in John Landis. Funny thing, too, I learned about her is that she went and shadowed nurses, too, to get an idea of what it was like to work in that field. That's some dedication. Right? I mean, I guess it's uh, not quite driving a taxi cab or something like that, but I don't know. Seems like she, she saw a couple things, I bet. And John Woodbine, who plays Dr. Hirsch, his story was kind of similar to everybody else's. John and Deborah went and saw a production of Nicholas Nickleby and just thought that he was incredible. Such a standout in this role. And in fact, the rest of the cast they thought was incredible. So John tried to cast basically all of Nicholas Nickleby in this film and ended up with about half of the cast in American Werewolf is from that production that they just happened to go see one particular night. So John Landis has notoriously used directors in many of his movies. Uh, We've got Joel Cohen in Sam Raimi in Spies Like Us. We've got George Lucas in Beverly Hills Cop 3. We have Steven Spielberg in The Blues Brothers. And even uh, in American World from London, John Landis called upon one of his director friends to act in not just a little cameo role, but a substantial role in this film. And Landis has said that when he needs an actor for a small bit to play an asshole, he's always going to go to Frank Oz. And man, Oz is a total jerk in that scene, just not understanding what David's going through, even though he's supposed to be his American liaison, saying, calm down. Calm down. What's wrong with you freaking out about your friend being murdered and you being put in the hospital? What's wrong with you, these stupid Americans? Yeah, Frank Oz does a great job. He's so good in this. <laughs> Landis uh, was one of those directors in the 80s who was just constantly, constantly on fire. Just one hit after another. After he did Schlock, his debut feature, he had a small hit with Kentucky Fried Movie. He went on to do Animal House, which was a gargantuan comedic hit. Followed that up with the Blues Brothers, which was also another huge hit before doing American Werewolf in London. But then after that, his first collaboration with Eddie Murphy in Trading Places, which was another just huge hit for Landis. But in 83, he was called upon by Michael Jackson to work on the thriller video 
which uh, became one of the most well-known music videos and one of the best-selling music videos of all time. He finished off the 80s uh, working on a few decent hits, Spies Like Us, Three Amigos, and then had his biggest hit, one of the movies he's most recognized for, and that's his second collaboration with Eddie Murphy and Coming to America. I do think Landis is uh, one of those directors who didn't fare as, as well in the 90s because some of his contemporaries like changed with the times. Landis kind of stayed with what he knew, but the comedy genre is like always forever changing. You know, every 10 years, every five years, you know, something becomes big or their, you know, trends follow. Landis went for a comedy with Sylvester Stallone and Oscar. It wasn't really a hit. We've got Innocent Blood, which was another movie that tried to mix comedy and horror. Lindsay, you're going to be talking about that soon. Landis had a really big flop with Beverly Hills Cop 3. It was a movie there. You could do a whole podcast on the behind the scenes of that movie. It's very you fascinating. You hate that movie so much. It's not just, I, it's not just that I hate it, but it's just, it's so, but it has an interesting behind the scenes story of yeah. like Landis and Eddie Murphy, yeah. just not on the same yeah. page through the whole thing. Just was kind of a rough thing. And Landis kind of drifted into Doing some weird stuff like a strange movie with Tom Arnold, a really, really almost unwatchable sequel in Blues Brothers 2000 before doing one of his final films that was a straight to video movie that he did write and direct, which I've not seen, which I I do want to amend that. And that's uh, Susan's plan. And uh, he did do actually a really interesting documentary in 2004 called Slasher that I really, really liked. And though uh, Landis is not known for doing documentaries, uh, he, I think he found a way to make a very, you know, use narrative driven story telling tools and, and cinematic style to make a documentary that was extremely entertaining definitely worth your time to check out but you know you could definitely say as far as like directors of the 80s John Landis is probably up there with the top 10 most successful directors to come out of that era and has you know a handful of movies that are are still recognized of films that people go back to time and time again that are still talking about just like American World from London 40 years later there's two people sitting here in front of microphones talking about why you should watch this movie and why it's important. Out of all of the behind the scenes information and, and things that I've read, the overall opinion of working with John Landis uh, on set is he's just a very energetic, determined, knows what he wants kind of guy, laughs a lot and is is very direct. Didn't ever have the air of you know, not wanting to hang out with the cast and the crew. He certainly did. And this was in 81. I don't know if he changed or evolved, but at least at that time, he did really pal around with them and tried to foster a positive work environment. So I think as a director, that's one of the most important things that you can do on set. And another thing that Landis does that uh, certain directors do, that's making the choice of using uh, popular music mixed with a score, not just going one way or the other. And I think it works really well in American Werewolf in London. He had the decision that he wanted to use songs that talked about the moon. Not only that, the song Blue Moon, three separate versions play throughout the movie. In the beginning, we have the more ballady uh, Blue Moon played by uh, Bobby Vinton. But then during the very, very uh, painful transformation sequence, we have Sam Cooke's version. And then we close it out with a very lively version by the Marcells. I love when that song kicks in at the very end of this movie. But then we also have Bad Moon Rising by Credence, also a Moon Dance by Van Morrison. So using um, very popular songs of the time or prior to that, and then also going for a composed score for other parts of the movie. And the composer for this film was the legendary Elmer Bernstein. To me, I think it was a really smart move on Landis's part to use basically half of your soundtrack be a score and then the other half be already existing songs. But when Bernstein's score pops in, it's at very important moments. The most notable and the ones that stick out are during David's nightmares or even when Alex, oh gosh, at the end when Alex is seeing David in the alley as a werewolf. These are just moments that are full of such high emotions and really call for having a score that's going to pull those feelings out of you. And Bernstein also did score the transformation scene. This was something that Landis didn't want, but Bernstein so wanted to have a score over this. But what happened was when it was put over the transformation scene, it made it a completely terrifying scene. And that is a very terrifying moment, but it seemed like the 
the real pain of it was kind of taken out and it was just replaced with straight up horror, which is a different spin on that scene. But I think having the contrasting music over the transformation scene was the smarter move there. But Bernstein's score is certainly memorable in this film. And he just has so many great scores and so many just amazing movies. Well, American Werewolf in London was released in the summer of 1981 and budgeted at a modest $6 million. It was sort of a sleeper hit, grossing about $60 million at the box office. And it did receive that R rating, but mostly for sex and nudity. I can't even get over that, that that was the alarming part about this film. That's why it got an R rating. There were some scenes cut out, though, one of which was barely any violence. It was just something that was kind of a gross-out factor, and then one was another werewolf attack. But out of everything in this movie, it just doesn't seem to me that, um, I don't know, cutting anything out of it that's not already worse than what's in it is just kind of a waste of time. But sex and nudity... That's worse than all of these werewolf attacks. Remember that. Still is. (laughs) And critics mostly were favorable for American Werewolf in London. Uh, Some did feel that, again, the horror and comedy didn't necessarily fit, but others felt that the movie was pretty ingenious for doing that. Over the years, in retrospect now, American Werewolf in London has been cited as being the start of mixing horror and comedy well, and that was the launching pad for movies like Evil Dead 2 and Beetlejuice. How about that story about uh, John Peters and Peter Gruber, the executive producers, who the first time that Landis showed them this film, they were just so upset and just irate, really, about, like, I heard somebody say that someone threw a chair out a window. Like, they were so mad about how violent it was. And Landis said, okay, give me your notes. I'll make the changes, and we'll meet back in two weeks. Landis has said this multiple times. He said, two weeks later, I showed him the film again. Nothing cut out. Nothing didn't take their notes or anything. And they were like, this is great. Perfect. I feel like there's so many stories like that amongst uh, directors and and producers. Are they true? I mean, I guess it has to be. I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, you never know. Either way, how important that this film was on so many different levels continues to live on. And I think that this movie is always going to have um, a great life to it. I don't think it's ever going to be look i mean sure it looks dated of like early 80s but nothing about it that makes it so special looks dated i think that this is one that's always going to stick around and i think it's also the movie that werewolf movies from here till the end of time are always gonna reference at least i'm sure before they make a movie like let's sit down and watch american war from london see how they did it right see what was the successful way to do it and is there a way to improve upon it i haven't seen it yet but i've seen some movies come pretty close (laughs) But let's stop there. We'll uh, we'll come back with some final thoughts on American Werewolf in London. But uh, let's get into our picks of the week. Lindsay, you stuck with uh, John Landis with Innocent Blood, which is a movie I haven't seen in a while, but it has stuck with me of trying to do the horror and comedy, but using vampires instead of werewolves. I don't know if that's an accurate uh, description of the movie, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, what can you tell me about Innocent Blood? That's pretty much it. That's all I was going to say. I knew it. At the onset of watching this movie, it might seem a little disjointed. It's a facet of the film which does continue, and depending on your taste, you could not be into it, or you could totally find it intriguing. Why I finally settled on doing Innocent Blood is for two reasons. One, uh, if you're someone who isn't immediately put off by comedic horror movies, you'll be able to take a chance on this one. And the second's just pretty basic. As a horror fan, when this movie gets bloody, it is not messing around. We talk about genre benders all the time on this podcast, and boy, this one takes the cake. Innocent Blood is a vampire movie, but borders on being a semi-zombie-ish movie at the same time. It's a stereotypical mob movie, also a cop drama, a thriller, even a love story thrown in for good measure. But most interestingly, with all these genres woven together, this is touted as a horror comedy. And if I were to give only one constructive criticism for this movie, it would be to not market it as a comedy. There are moments of slight humor or an attempted joke, but every other genre element in the film is just so overpowering, the comedy's diminished. But then again, I don't view American Werewolf as a comedy either, so maybe this is just my problem. The writing process of this one went through a bunch of different hands, including comic legend and Spinal Tap band member Henry Shearer. But after Warner Brothers rejected what he had turned in, writer Michael Wolff took over the rewrite. 
and director John Landis said the studio gave him room to breathe with this one too. I wonder how much though, because Landis is a fantastic visual storyteller, but I think the man can get carried away. And I enjoy mostly everything he's put out there. I'm just questioning if there's ever anyone who's able to reel him in. With that said, another reason this film is unique and unexpected is for its extreme viciousness. Like I said, it's bloody. It's also kind of gross, and it has a lot of graphic moments that you were not prepared for. And I don't get the drift that any of this was done for comedic effect. A lot of that blood comes at the hands of our lead vampire, Marie, played by French actress Anne Perriot. Using a female vampire is much more interesting to me, especially when many view the idea of a vampire, the act of biting a neck, to be somewhat sexual. There's no real sexiness involved in the vampire attacks here, but the idea of sexuality is not at all abandoned in innocent blood. It gets a little sexy at times. And though it's not followed through with, you might catch the drift of Marie only desiring to kill and drain the blood of bad guys. So when she happens to come across some real bad dudes in the mafia, she starts binge sucking on some Italian ex and then is pretty pleased with herself. She justifies her killings and has absolved herself from causing harm. However, one guy that she bites and who comes back as a vampire does not share her same slight moral compass. And that guy is uh, Sal the Shark, the head of the Philadelphia crime ring played by Robert Loja. After attacking him, Marie accidentally doesn't finish the job, thus vamping Sal. I don't remember Loja in a movie quite as outlandish as this before, so it's kind of cool to see such an acclaimed actor bring such automatic legitimacy to a volatile vampire movie with a comedic edge. On the flip side, we've got Anthony LaPaglia, uh, who's our good guy in this story, though he's an easy third of the lead roles. He's just the normal guy in amongst all this chaos, such a professional cop, he's barely even phased by vampires being in his town. He doesn't overpower Marie, who teams up with him in order to stop Sal from slowly turning his entire mafia force into vampires. And there are a billion smaller roles and appearances, like uh, legendary comedian Don Rickles, Angela Bassett playing a top cop in charge. I think she's really underused here, but she brings her A-game no matter what. The Sopranos own Polly, Tony Sirico, and David Proval, who played Richie Aprile on that show, Chaz Palminteri, Luis Guzman, The Abysses, uh, Leo Burmeister, Marshall Bell, and even crazy cameo moments by Frank Oz, Tom Savini, Sam Raimi, and even director Dario Argento. And speaking of those last three guys, Innocent Blood does have its fair share of creepy moments, like Marie lowering herself down from a ceiling in the shadows. But what'll always stand out for this movie, I think, is the overall reason to watch it are the gnarly special effects. Namely, every single wicked neck bite wound. And Robert Loja and Don Rickles on fire. The Don Rickles part is great. I might have rewound that a couple of times just because it was so cool. Landis has said that Innocent Blood is something like imagining Martin Scorsese directed a Hammer film. And to some degree, I can see what he's saying, but for me, the Scorsese element is limited to just the Italian subject matter and the violence. I get more of the Hammer comparison there, but that vibe rings very true through the dramatic lighting, shadows, and really intense color with sweeping orchestral music at times. Being that Innocent Blood was also known as a French vampire in America, it being a horror movie directed by John Landis, and even sharing the Frank Oz cameo with American Werewolf in London, it just felt like I had to do this as my pick this week. It's not perfect, but if you can stomach a blend of bloody vampire horror, it's a mob movie, a comedy blended into a flashier hammer film, you might be left scratching your head or completely entertained by Innocent Blood. Either way, I watched it three times and I enjoyed it. You know, I think it is a good pairing with American Werewolf. When you told me you're going to do that as your pick of the week, I wanted to watch it before we recorded, but I didn't get to. But I plan on uh, checking it out. Um, it's been a while, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't. I totally forgot about the compare and contrast that she's from France and comes to America for that one. I think it's great that that uh, Landis took another stab at doing the horror comedy after spending, you know, a decade away from it. All right, I really want to know what's going on with your pick this week with Thriller. I can't wait to hear this. Yeah, I know Thriller's technically not a feature film, but I do consider it a short film. Even though it's a music video, the long version of it is about 13 minutes long, and it does the the beginning and end uh, more play like a short film with an extended music video in the middle with Michael Jackson doing the Thriller dance that everybody knows. The video, pretty interesting how it came to be Michael Jackson's 
Thriller was the number one record for like a year, all through 1982. And the record dipped in the charts. Um, it was overtaken by the soundtrack to Flashdance. And Jackson really, you know, at that time, he was the biggest star in the world. He wanted his record to stay at number one. I mean, it's it's insane to think of a record staying number one on the charts for a year now. I mean, much less like a month. But Michael Jackson uh, was very innovative. Music videos, they were getting popular, but MTV hadn't been around for very long. He had two successful music videos for Beat It and Billie Jean. And he's like, well, let's put a music video out a year after the album's been out for Thriller, sort of revitalize the record. Michael Jackson had recently seen American World from London. He contacted John Landis. Movie directors weren't really known for doing uh, small shorts or music videos at the time, but John Landis, seeing how huge Michael Jackson was, he was curious about the project, so he talked to Michael Jackson. Landis had him had an idea of like, well, why don't you be like a werewolf in the 50s and kind of model it after uh, I was a teenage werewolf. Jackson really liked the idea. Landis contacted Rick Baker and said, hey, you know, I've got this idea. I'm working with Michael Jackson. And Rick Baker was excited about it, but he said, you know, I, I really don't want to do another werewolf. Like, we just did that. So he uh, changed it to a were-a-cat which is why when you see Michael Jackson transform, he sort of almost has like, it's like a strange, aggressive cat head. It's not necessarily a werewolf. I mean, it's a werewolf, but it's it's very a very strange looking werewolf. But the music video is essentially Michael Jackson and Playmate model Ola Ray. It takes place in the 50s and he transforms. Then eventually you see that they're watching it as a movie in a movie theater. We have a movie within a movie. Then it goes into a long dance sequence in which Jackson turns into a zombie and we have all the zombies dancing. Landis was the perfect director for this. He's really a big fan of music. When I was re-watching Thriller, I immediately thought of the huge dance sequence that they have in Coming to America. This is, is really something that Landis excels at, and I've read in interviews that he would have always loved to have done like a musical. But it's a really, really great short. It's uh, good to watch anytime, but it's really fun to watch during the Halloween season. Um, I think it's a, a great mix of good music, great dance sequence, and then we have this nice little throwback of old horror movies. And it's it's also a lot of fun. The video itself was a huge success. I mean, I think at the time, it was a number one selling VHS of all time for a while there. And they also made a behind the scenes documentary that was, which is what I saw, it was one of the first behind the scenes documentaries I had ever seen on the making of something that actually was one of the videos that sort of made behind the scenes documentaries on entertainment projects like become popular. It's definitely worth watching. It's as interesting as the the video itself. Currently there's a really great uh, high definition version of the entire thriller video on YouTube that you should totally check out and watch. This is the perfect month for it. Again, it's a lot of fun and uh, I love the whole album, but thriller is such a great song. As much fun as this video is, it terrified me as a kid. Oh, me too. But I couldn't stop watching it. <laughs> the were cat. I never really thought about it. It is a cat, isn't it? I think inferred that it was just a different looking wolf, but yeah, it's a cat. Huh. Good job, Rick Baker. Well, those are our picks, Innocent Blood and Michael Jackson's Thriller. Now here's your Murray moment. <laughs> Chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear, and when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. You're gonna come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even chill. Mm, hey, this is so scrumptious. Is this hand shot? The flowing robes, the grace, all striking. That was fun. All right, this Murray moment's going to be a twofer. If only I could just call Bill himself for these moments, I tell you. 
In the beginning of American Werewolf, it's one of my most favorite and most memorable aspects of the movie, just the the scenery, just everything where they are in Northern England. And I wanted to see if I could find something in relation to that. And even though the beginning of this movie was not actually filmed in Northern England, just set there, it's a dead ringer for those ever so beautiful yet haunting moors of Yorkshire. Well, just a little over an hour away from Yorkshire lay the town of Gateshead, which experienced an anomalous event as unique as a real-life werewolf attack. Okay, I'm being a little dramatic, but it's an art exhibit wherein Bill Murray was used as an inspiration, and that sure feels like a rare event to me. In 2015, artist Brian Griffiths created a true Murray experience. Using the man as his muse, this sculptural walkthrough exhibit was meant for folks to explore how we experience space and measure objects. The show was called Bill Murray, a story of distance, time, and serenity, and uses the man's image on every object included while also imagining objects or spaces related to the man. Creating fantasy landscapes isn't just limited to movie making, it can also be a full-on experience of an art exhibit. From houses to a helicopter, a piano, even a miniature whiskey bar, Billy's involved in every piece, and it's up to the audience to either understand the correlation or create your own narrative. Griffiths is an artist known for using found objects as art, and includes Billy as just that, found object art. He's really good material, Griffiths told The Guardian, and went on to say that it was the man's attitude which inspired the show. Citing the reason behind this installation, Griffith said that Billy's attitudes towards life, namely, and I quote, he's the guy next door, the anti-brand, the irrepressible Lothario, the lovable gruff, the wisecracker, the emotionally brittle, lost man, the freewheeling guy, the uncle you never had, and that droll philosopher, and even the hopeful. And I can totally see all of these descriptions within the man. The exhibit itself was installed with a massive open room with a mezzanine so visitors could look down upon this world in which Billy was everywhere. It was meant to be an exploration of scale and the size of an object and how we relate to them in the space. Up close, these objects can seem massive. Even the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art, where the exhibit was held, was used as a piece because a 65-foot banner of Murray hung there during the show. And from far away, it looks so small, but up close, it's overwhelming. Fascinated by how size and scale works, Griffiths told The Guardian that ambition and scales, points of view, and size are all in flux. In the end, you have to measure up to the works. And Billy's no stranger to the idea of metaphysical journeys. And this exhibit is along those lines. That being a physical journey itself of what you see, but also how you experience and take it in. Griffith said that he did try to contact Bill without any results, and I found no mention of Billy's thoughts on the matter. I could only imagine what they are. I remember him being interviewed once about the documentary, The Bill Murray Stories. In that interview, he was asked, well, have you seen it? And he responded something like, I'll have plenty of time to see that when I'm dead. Hey, man, I would have paid admission to experience this, and it would have been the ultimate in a metaphysical journey for Bill to experience it himself. But speaking of meta moments, I've got one more American Werewolf Minnie Murray moment for you. Let's leave Northern England and travel over to Canada to 1979. And if you're a fan of this segment, you've heard me bring up Meatballs a time or two. For those fans of American Werewolf and Billy's movie Meatballs, get ready to have your minds blown. In this star-making camp classic of a movie, there's a memorable scene in which Billy is working some sweet improvised dance moves with another counselor, laying on that innocently sleazy Lothario vibe. And though sleazy, it's Billy, so it's kind of charming. You know, you're not really threatened by it. Well, if you listen closely, there's a fairly hard-hitting 70s disco song called Makin' It playing all throughout this two-and-a-half-minute scene. And before he was the American werewolf in London, the film star David Naughton released a super groovy disco hit, which would also be the only single he ever released. That's right, campers. It's David Naughton narrating Billy's attempts to make it with another counselor in Meatballs. I know this is more of a fun fact than a Murray moment, but I figured this was probably the only way I was going to be able to creatively impart this knowledge to you guys. So there you go. Your two for Murray moment. Billy inspired art hailing from the same lands of American werewolf in Northern England. And the only time Billy and David Naughton's voices are on top of each other caught on film. Super deep dives here. I like the two for. Yeah. (laughs) That's wild. I never knew that. That's, uh, That's pretty crazy that. David Naughton did that voice. I had uh, stumbled on the information that he did a song, so I took a listen on YouTube, but I like the uh, connection you made there. Well, thank you, 
as always, for that Murray moment. Of course. Did you have any uh, final thoughts on American Werewolf in London before we close this episode out? One little tidbit of information I found out was, was pretty fascinating. That being that for a brief period of time, there was a sequel to this. And I'm not talking about American Werewolf in Paris. So John Landis was asked to write a sequel, and he did. And he wrote one draft of it. As the plot goes, and there's very limited information on this, Debbie Klein is only mentioned in the beginning of American Werewolf in London. It's David and Jack talking about a girl that Jack likes and David thinks she's overrated. Anyway, that Debbie Klein. She travels to England to investigate what happened to Jack and David. And she tracks down Alex, the nurse who was in love with David, who is now a shut-in and living with Dr. Hirsch. And here's the kicker. Alex is now a werewolf, and Hirsch has to lock her up once a month, and that's all I know of the plot. But it sounds kind of not bad. Like, I would be interested in seeing that uh, worked out. But when Landis brought it to the Polygram president at the time, he was basically offended and just, like, couldn't even believe that Landis thought about doing this or wanted to do it and offered up a bunch of changes, and Landis refused to make any of those changes, and thus the project died. I would have liked to have seen that. I like his direction on taking characters and like going in a in a new yeah. way than just like sort of redoing what he did in the first one, which is why uh, it probably didn't get funded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We want you to just do London again. Just do Werewolf in London again, just in a different way. Maybe let's set it in Paris. Anyway, what about you, Justin? What's your final thought? Yeah, just a quick little thing, couple things. Uh, one, I didn't mention it in the beginning, but John Landis early in his career had a very brief stint as a stuntman, and uh, he has a tiny little bit part in American World from London when that just total insanity of that 10 minutes or so where there's all the car crashes. Landis uh, has a stunt where he gets hit by a car and gets thrown through a window. Um, he's got like a bandana on his head. He kind of looks like an old hippie. And I've always been a fan of werewolf movies. And so I wanted to see if there was any that I hadn't seen. And so I was kind of like looking through searching werewolf movies. And I watched two over the last few weeks in conjunction with American Werewolf. And that was the movie Bad Moon, which had a pretty atrocious beginning, but then uh, actually like, turned out to be halfway decent. It wasn't too bad. Um, but one that I actually really did enjoy that I thought was pretty unique for a werewolf movie was a movie called Dog Soldiers. It's pretty brutal and very, very violent. And man, it's it's like pretty relentless, uh, like nonstop sort of action. It has sort of almost like a werewolf meets predator situation going on definitely worth a look if you haven't seen it i think it came out 2001 2002 but i'm always on the lookout for a new werewolf movie if you've seen any uh recently hit us up on social media let us know what werewolf movies you like the best and if you aren't following us on social media please do you can find us on facebook twitter instagram we have a youtube channel please subscribe we still have two more horror movies coming up for the rest of october uh, we'll be doing uh, my bloody valentine the 1981 version followed by the evil dead 1981 we're staying with our 40th anniversary series until next time, I'm Justin Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Reaper. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah.